Hello and welcome to all our online viewers, stream.aljazeera.com. That's where you are and that's where you're watching us. It's the pre-show. Just before we begin a packed program, we're going to be talking Equatorial Guinea, we're going to be talking Iceland and much, much more. Ahmed and Zed have just been discussing the semantics of what is anti-Semitic and what is not, what is offensive and what is not. And that's because Apple have taken down, Ahmed, the Third Intifada app. Tell us about that. Yes, that's true. So uh, there was lots of talk about this, and then we, you wrote an article about it today. But apparently, uh, the Apple uh, company, I mean Apple rather, has removed the Intifada app from the store on the grounds that it is offensive to a large group of people. So go ahead. Maybe you want to talk about it since you wrote about it. I'll pull it up right here on my screen. Sure. So basically, for a few weeks now, Apple uh, has been under pressure from a lot of people. It w some of them were uh, activists like the S Simon Reason Wiesenthal Center. Others were the Israeli government themselves. They've been making requests to basically take down this app that's calling for a third intifada, which is Arabic for uprising uh, against the Israelis. And Ahmed actually has the app pulled up right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to talk people through it. I mean, right here, this is like their news section, right? So these, this is a series. Uh, this is a series of news um, articles. And then if you click here, this is more news, but I guess feature news articles. And then has a series of different features. Um, I'm just going to go back right here. See, this is, you could play uh, songs that are presumably patriotic. There's also a series of videos that you can scroll through. Rather than playing it, I'll just show you, of course, um, there's Hebrew comments. There's a commenting system built in where people can comment right. in Hebrew and Arabic, really in a any language. Um, since we haven't checked these uh, comments, but I'm not going to get into them. Yeah, Zed, this sets a dangerous precedent, doesn't it? No, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, if you can't basically be engaged in speech that Apple disapproves of or deems offensive, you know, then what can you be engaged in? And this is really interesting. I actually found this and I pulled this up right here. On iTunes, you can actually go and find an app by the Israeli government called the Is Israel MFA app. And basically, it's the mirror image right. of the Palestinian app. It has propaganda against the Palestinians, talking about Palestinian incitement, talking mm -hmm. about the Israeli humanitarian, quote unquote, humanitarian lifeline to Gaza. So basically, Apple's following a double standard here. Saying yeah, but that it will, you but know, then theoretically, I mean, I, Ahmed, what's to stop Palestinian activists from uh, approaching Apple and saying this is offensive and for them to well, get that taken down? No, you have a good point. I mean, obviously, Israelis in this country, the Jewish, through the Jewish lobby and just through the recent history, are more influential, so to mm. speak, are in positions you know, more so than I would assume Arabs or Palestinian activists mm. in terms of Apple responding to them. But that's, uh, it's, a, it's a valid point because, frankly, in this New York Times article, it says that the Simon, I'm going to just highlight this part right here, the Simon Wiesen, I believe it's Wiesenthal Center, a group dedicated to stopping anti-Semitism, put out a statement uh, mm -hmm. on Tuesday asking them to immediately withdraw its approval of the application. And uh, it was on the g grounds that it contains anti-Israel content. Mm -hmm. Well, right here, uh, we have the app. I don't know if you can see this, but the app that he's talking about, which is the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Israel, which has a lot of uh, videos where they, you know, you could argue that it's offensive to mm. the Palestinian plight, but also to political groups, you know. And so the question is, there's millions of Muslims who might be offended by this app or mi millions of Palestinian sympathizers, you know. So the question is, you know, how do you, how do you really corroborate this? How do you judge what a lot of people is? Right, and I also think there's just millions of advocates for free speech, you know, people who want a free debate in this country about issues like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I just don't think it's fair to be allowing, you know, Israeli government subsidized propaganda onto the iTunes store and mm -hmm. not to allow, you know, grassroots Palestinian activists to have their say as well. Yeah. Have we ever heard of an app being taken down before this? Y yeah, presumably there have been apps that are taken down. I mean, app Apple's store policy under Section 19 says, and I'll quote right here if you can pull up the screen, says, app apps containing references or commentary about a religious, cultural, or ethnic group that are defamatory, offensive, mm -hmm mean-spirited or likely to expose the targeted group to harm or violence will be rejected. Mm, mm. Um, so, I mean, the question is, you know, again, it's the same thing. I'm sure, mm. I don't know if this is the first app that has been pulled down on this, on these kind of grounds. Mm. Um, mm. But there's definitely been a precedent, even the paragraph below it, we know that Facebook removed a group from, uh, right. from you know, the third intifada group as well. Right. Um, and then the other groups came up, and then they removed them as well. So it's, it's been a back and forth. Well, th and this is interesting. I actually, during the healthcare debate in this country a couple years ago, and I pulled this up, Wired.com notes that uh, an app advocating for single-payer healthcare, basically Canadian-style healthcare, right. was rejected because it was politically charged. So what's going on here? You know, was Apple picking and choosing you know, progressive causes to reject and allowing things like the Israeli uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs? There's also a financial incentive, so to speak. Did you mention that about... 
Right, exactly. Uh, if you if you go to iTunes right. and you you can basically you can you know you can buy any movie, you can buy any uh, audio with any book, sort of can, content yeah. that's inflammatory or political. right, exactly. And, and the difference is that these apps are free, are right. basically for activists, whereas these are you know these other things are basically what Apple's making money off of. So you know what we're asking is. You know, is Apple basically in here to make a buck, or are they in here for a principle too? And I think a lot of their consumers really would want them standing up for free, free speech much harder. Well, what's interesting is that you mentioned Ahmed, mm -hmm. uh, both Facebook and Apple, and it, it brings me to the thought that uh, there's this assumption that mm -hmm. a lot of this technology is non-ideological, completely mm -hmm. by default objective, right. and then there's a lot of sanctimonious moralizing mm -hmm. um, in the direction of China, for example, when right. it starts blocking things and says you can't right. say this or that uh, so on our service. To a lesser extent, yeah. this is happening here, yeah. uh, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating here with uh, this with third Apple. intifada app. No, you're totally right, and you know, from my perspective, the thing that frustrates me most about this, or that maybe you know, you know, evokes some curiosity, is, is the question that these tools, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, have been you know, hailed for you know, bringing a, a sense of civic engagement yeah. online to a part of the world, the Arab world, where it hasn't really been tolerated. So you can include, you know, nonviolent protest or the intifada in that. So, you know, you see them being championed for this, and then at the same time, they're yeah. arbitrarily, and I use the word arbitrarily because their policy is not clear. It's, it's inconsistent. Right. Why are they choosing to take down these pages and not others? Mm -hmm. oh, just quickly, sorry, we have a tweet from Iron Chariots on this issue saying, Apple arbitrarily blocking apps they dislike is nothing new. To answer, I think your question, and is fact their modus operandi. So, yeah, no. Zed, Zed, if you were, I mean, very quickly, if you were from the Chinese government and, and you saw this, you'd say, well, "You guys are calling us out all the time. Look at yourselves." Well, no, exactly, and I think that's exactly the issue. In the United States, we have very, very strong free speech laws. What we don't have right now is corporations respecting free speech. Right. So we have to, all, we all have to be vigilant, and you know. The best way to send these corporations a message is to not frequent them when they do things like this. Okay, Ahmed's getting a cup of coffee. Zed's. Uh, do you want one? Uh, no, thanks. I'm, I'm okay. Great. I've just had mine. <laughs> My mouth is dry now. Yeah. Um, get ready for the main event, the main show on Al Jazeera English. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds' time. We'll see you on the other side of this. Hello and welcome. I'm Imran Garta filling in for Derek Ashong and you're in the stream, a social media community with its very own TV show. We're bringing you the stories that are ongoing, global and sourced from social media. Today, Equatorial Guinea is blessed with natural wealth but has one of the worst human rights records in the world. So why isn't anyone talking about it? And Iceland looks to crowdsource its new constitution. Is this the next step in democracy or mob rule? Well, as always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shihabuddin, is here tracking all of your feedback. And joining us on the couch next to him for a second day is Zed Jilani, who is a reporter blogger for thinkprogress.org. Zed, uh, any stories that have been grabbing your attention today? Sure. So I've actually pulled up right here a story by my uh, colleague, Ali Garib, talking about the State Department. We actually mentioned the flotilla yesterday, and, and one country that's been very, very silent on the flotilla has been the United States. But actually, what, what uh, my colleague Ali noted is that the State Department actually put out a special warning yesterday talking about what would actually may happen to Americans who travel over there. And they actually said that they may result, that traveling to uh, break the blockade may result in injury, death, arrest, and deportation of U.S. citizens, which is really fascinating because as of yet, they haven't done anything mm. about the American citizen who was killed in the flotilla disaster last year. Yeah, of course, uh, a dual Turkish-American citizen, and uh, many believe that the United States, in a way, hid behind the fact that he was also a Turk and said, okay, he was mm -hmm. Turkish. No, absolutely, and I, and, and I think it's just remarkable that our government, as, as of yet, hasn't really stood up for our mm. own citizens versus you know, a foreign country, Israel. And I'm glad that Ali wrote this story and let people know that the State Department you know, needs to get its eye on the ball here. Okay, Zed, look forward to your thoughts uh, during the rest of the show. Well, let us know what uh, stories you're following. You can share them by tweeting us at 
AJ Stream. Hello, my name is Leila Saleh and I use social media to help bring awareness to the Palestinian cause and I'm in the stream. Now, Equatorial Guinea has the highest GDP in all of Africa, largely due to the discovery of oil. But despite its wealth, some 70% of Equatorial Guineans live in poverty and child mortality remains relatively high. In fact, one report says it's the highest in the world. Critics blame the country's longtime ruler, President Teodore Obiang Ngema, who seized power from his uncle in 1979. Human rights groups accuse the Obiang government of massive corruption, torture and denying press freedom. Despite all of this, much of the world's media has ignored the situation there. But one small group of activists known as the Colectivo is trying to change all of that. Let's have a look at their web page. They don't have too much up on the internet, but this is one of their web pages. It's in Spanish, so apologies if you don't speak Spanish. You won't know what it says. However, you could go there, theoretically, and do a semi-decent job with Google Translate. That's the page, Colectivo de Jovenes de Guinea Equatorial. Apologies for the pronunciation over there. They've also got a song endorsing the movement by Nakeli Pana, and just generally talking about the situation of the youth and those who are disillusioned in this country of massive economic disparities. Let's play some of it from YouTube. <laughs> So we're seeing a montage of pictures from Equatorial Guinea. Fascinating symbol there, the drum with the shell symbol of the oil company. And uh, many of the lyrics trying to highlight the fact that all this immense wealth that has come from oil and gas. In fact, one US official called Equatorial Guinea the new Kuwait. All of that oil and gas and other minerals not filtering down to uh, the everyday people in the country and it's leading to a lot of frustration because there's a small elite holding on to a lot of cash and a lot of wealth. There's also the latest report from Amnesty International which has spoken about uh, recent arrests that have been taking place. Let's just take you to uh, the top line there. Equatorial Guinea surge in arbitrary arrests ahead of AU summit. Equatorial Guinea, the revolving head of the AU at this moment in time, and it says the authorities in Equatorial Guinea must immediately end a draconian clampdown on freedom of expression taking place ahead of the AU summit in the capital, Malabo, on the 23rd of June. And that's from Amnesty International. You can go to Amnesty's website for the full report. And uh, it does paint a fairly sordid picture about the current situation for those who want to dissent and want to have uh, their voices heard. But the President Obiang has been uh, speaking in encouraging terms about the challenges ahead and, of course, what he feels have been uh, the major developments in the country and the fact that he's getting it on its own two feet. Let's listen to some of what he had to say in 2010. There we go. Hemos superado el programa de, de la reconstrucción del país. Estamos ahora en la fase de construcción. Eh, francamente, eh, todo el mundo asegura de que Guinea Ecuatorial se ha transformado, se ha transformado. Y esa transformación se ve en los aspectos infraestructural, en los aspectos moral de, del pueblo, porque realmente el pueblo se siente sano. Por eso yo creo que es un eh, cambio importante desde el punto de vista político económico del país y por lo tanto todo el mundo lo certifica. So there's a transformation, everybody can attest to it, everybody's feeling satisfied. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming our first guest is not entirely satisfied with the situation in Equatorial Guinea and of course what the president had to say. Let's speak to Tutu Alicante, the executive director of EG Justice, which is an advocacy group working for the rights of Equatorial Guineans. Welcome to the stream Tutu, great pleasure having you on the program. Um, tell us, first of all, your response to the president. You heard uh, that clip that I just played there. He says things are more or less okay in the country. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me in the program. 
One thing that the president doesn't talk about in that clip is that 75% of the people in Equatorial Guinea today still do not have access to clean water or running water. 75% of the people in Equatorial Guinea today still live on less than a dollar a day. You know, and that, so when he talks about everybody being satisfied and everybody being, attest, being able to attest to the developments in the country, I am not sure what percentage of people he's talking about mm -hmm. because, again, if you look at the statistics from IMF, World Bank, UNDP, two-thirds of Equator Guineans uh, still lack basic amenities. Basic yeah, you're right. Statistics. You're right. Those, those statistics are a scathing indictment of his policies and the inequalities in the country. Now, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Colectivo, this movement that is trying to fight back. And tell us also... Tell our viewers why it's been so difficult for so many journalists, including ourselves, to get hold of them and to actually get them to appear on camera to talk to us, to tell us about their gripes with the government. Well, Imra, one thing you should know is that following the events in uh, Tahrir Square and everything that happened in Tunisia, Libya and other places in North Africa, President Obiang, who is currently chairing the African Union, and in fact this week the African Union is meeting in Equatorial Guinea, President Obiang went on national TV to say that national radio, national TV should not publish any news, should not broadcast any news having to do with the events in North Africa. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know also that journalists inside the country, they subsequently feature any footage of what was happening in North Africa, have been heavily reprimanded. We also know that last week, a group of uh, TV, uh, a TV crew from Germany who was in Equatorial Guinea filming had all the footage, all the uh, footage confiscated. Right. And as you mentioned, uh, journalists from abroad, Al Jazeera and others, have um, not been given visas or when they're inside the country, they've been followed and harassed. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Tutu, and, now, if I yes. could ask, do you, do you and your group, do you view the AU summit as a positive thing because it'll bring the media to your country and sort of allow them to display the situation? Or do you actually view it as a negative thing because it may give legitimacy to a government that may not deserve it? Yeah, unfortunately, it gives legitimacy to the government that doesn't deserve it, right? And a year ago, we had a similar battle with UNESCO when UNESCO almost accepted money from the government of Equatorial Guinea to create an award named after him, $3 million. And this is a country, again, in which kids go to school. Uh, kids have to walk miles and miles to go to school, uh, do not have running water before they go to school. Most of them do not have any anything to eat before they go to school. And UNESCO was about to accept this money, and we precisely made that point that uh, this money is going to let legitimize a government that doesn't deserve it. And it's the same situation here. We're looking at the same situation. Tutu, uh, I just want to say about that UNESCO story you're talking about in 2010 in October, I'll, we covered this uh, story. So for our viewers, we can tweet out this link for people who want to find out more. But on Twitter, we're getting a comment from Gutmang saying, Equatorial Guineans live in squalor while Obiang lives like Jay-Z. Uh, he's saying Africa needs uprisings, Nigeria, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Gambia, and the list goes on. Now, I just want to highlight something you were talking about earlier. Uh, you know, it seems that he spent over $830 million to build Sipopo, which is this uh, right here on my screen, this little area where the summit is actually being held. And that's a fourth of how much he's spending on the actual education system um, exactly. in the country. So one other tweet that came in to, is Ka Guata saying, well, what about the African Nations Cup that's going to be held in Equatorial Guinea next year? What do you make of that? Is there going to be an uproar? Uh, well, uh, we hope so. The international community, these are precisely the moments in which people, I mean, you have to know that Equatorial Guinea is a country of 500,000 people, a small country. And we desperately need voices from outside. We desperately need voices like the voices that we're hearing today from Al Jazeera, uh, really raising uh, um, the standards here, mm -hmm. you know, putting um, more pressure on the U.S. government and on other governments to ensure that uh, governments like the one in Equatorial Guinea that does not respect human rights, that does not care about democracy, that does not investing these people uh, are held to account. Uh, Tutu, right? Tutu, one of the events that announced Equatorial Guinea to the Western world was that 2004 coup attempt. And of course, those mass arrests that happened and the involvement of, uh, you know, the, the alleged involvement of Margaret Thatcher's son, Mark Thatcher. Do you think that if that 2004 coup had actually materialized, would Equatorial Guinea be better or worse off now? 
Well, as a human rights lawyer, uh, I can never advocate for violence, right? And what we need in Equatorial Guinea is actually to build institutions that can guarantee democracy for the long run. With that, who I'm not sure that the institutions were in place uh, to guarantee uh, long-lasting democracy, which is what we need. So, unfortunately, I cannot say that that would have been a positive in the long run. And do you, uh, do you fear, are you afraid that with all of these scathing t statistics that you are mentioning to us now about the inequality, the child mortality rates among the worst in the world. Are you afraid that your country is becoming one of those stereotypical, quote unquote, banana republics that people talk about, where your natural resources become a curse and not a blessing? Well, unfortunately, it has occurred already. Unfortunately, we are already there. Look, uh, in the last couple of days, I've been in several interviews in which uh, the U uh, Equator Guinean ambassadors in the UK and even the president have said this, there is no poverty in Equatorial Guinea. There are no human rights violations in Equatorial Guinea. This is how they see it. And what that means you know, is basically they don't, see, they don't think they have any work to do in terms of reforming human rights, democracy, transparency. So unfortunately, and, and that is what there is to be admired with this group of collectivos, right? These young people who have been born in a dictatorship, but the result of what's happening in North Africa have been inspired to start something that by all means, you know, is, is something that no one else would have dared do in Equatorial Guinea. And again, with the music that you play for Narcalipana and other young people uh, that today are using rap or hip hop to express their feeling, we begin to see a, resor a resurgence, you know, young people, they're willing to speak up, they're willing to challenge the system. And that, so I'm, I'm definitely hopeful for the future of Equatorial Guinea, but not because of right. the leaders that we have in place today. Articulately put, Tutu Alicante, thank you very much for joining us on the stream. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, you can follow this story on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. There you'll find much, much more videos and links to the Collectivo blog. Here it is. Uh, a new voice from Equatorial Guinea on our main page, stream.aljazeera.com. Right, Ahmed's ready to give us some uh, feedback from our contributors and all our followers. I understand we've got some news from Morocco. Yes, uh, today we got a story shared with us uh, about Morocco's King Mohammed, who gave a speech a couple days ago and who has also promised constitutional reforms uh, and a referendum vote on July 1st. So we have 10 days before that vote. Um, as you can see, here's the, the king, but uh, these are some protesters we, or royalists that have come out in big numbers to actually support the king um, since the speech. This is the actual night of the speech. And uh, we received a video from Warda Sahra, um, which shows these royalists allegedly or actually cornering and threatening a prominent human rights activist. So I'm just going to play the video. This right here is Khadija, as you can see the woman there, and the police is protecting her. Now, she, uh, this is allegedly in Casablanca, I believe. Um, but uh, we, we want to just highlight the fact that Warda Sahra you know, shared this video with us and then afterwards said that she thinks it's really sad that the king gives a 55% literate population only 10 days to vote on a constitution that has tons of legal jargon in it. So the question is, is that fair? Well, no, I don't think it is at all. I think we're actually seeing a repeat of what we saw in countries like Iraq and right. uh, Egypt, where actually the elites, the military, the sort of established order, put together a vote very, very quickly and didn't allow the population to really have a chance to go at it and really understand it before they voted on it. So we'll be following the story just to okay. see what happens. Um, and of course, if uh, you want to talk to us, we want to hear from you. So share your stories with us at AJ Stream, or you could always create an I'm in the stream video, which we've been playing um, and we'll include it in the show. So here's Ben to tell you how to do that. Hi, I'm Ben Connors and I work for the stream. One of my jobs is to make these little I'm in the stream videos, but I need your help. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we want you to send us a video. Tell us your name, something interesting, and then say I'm in the stream. Keep it short, upload the video to YouTube, then tweet us the link at AJStream and you can wind up here on Al Jazeera. He couldn't have asked in a nicer way, Al yeah. Jazeera's very own Ben Connors. Now, after the collapse of its banking system in 2008, Iceland decided it needed a new constitution. Now, normally, important documents like this are drawn up by politicians and so-called experts. But Iceland is taking a very different approach, crowdsourcing, which means it's basically going with the wisdom of the crowd. 
and soliciting input from all parts of the country. Let's have a look at this Facebook page, which gives people a fair idea as to what they're doing. This is their Facebook page, and interestingly enough, they've given us a bit of a promo for the show. There you go. Tonight at 7.45, Icelandic time, GMT plus one, Al Jazeera will broadcast an interview with one member of the Constitutional Council and discuss the task of the council and they give a link and it also speaks about the entire movement to amend the constitution so far 3613 likes well they are a very small country anyway they've also got a, a Flickr uh, page as well where they upload photographs from their meetings Th apparently they live stream all their meetings as well so it's all looking very busy and happy and democratic over there um, so plenty of photographs if you visit Flickr and uh, it would help if you understood Icelandic to uh, to read some of the captions, but you get a, a taste of it even if you don't. Well, with us now via Skype from Reykjavik is Katrin Otsdotter. I hope I've said your name correctly, a member of Iceland's Constitutional Council. Great to have you in the stream. Katrin, tell us how you got elected. Okay, well, are you talking about the council in uh, general or me personally? Just the council. To the, to the council, yeah. Good, good. Okay, well, it started out... Um, years ago we have always known that we had to re revise our constitution it's basically very old and the, the most of it's just uh, from when we got independent in 1944 then we replaced the word king with president and said okay fine it'll do we need our independence and then we always wanted to review, review it but we never found the right opportunity now after iceland has crushed like uh, you, uh, you probably know we are finally doing it and it's a great opportunity to be doing it at such a uh, crossroads in our in our times. So we started out by doing a real crowdsourcing moment where we randomly selected 950,000 people, just any people from Iceland, uh, from the age of 18 to 100 years old. And they all had to come together in a large like gym uh, house and just think about what sort mm -hmm. of a community or what sort of society they wanted Iceland to become. So they all came together in November last year and they had a massive brainstorm and they, they figured out what sort of a nation we should try to become. And then uh, a bunch of specialists tried to write some sort of report on how we could change our constitution so it could, could meet those expectations of the people. And finally, 25 people were elected for a constitution council, which are the ones that are there now. But we had a little bit of a, a, a breakdown when uh, our Supreme Court said that the elections weren't valid. But after that, we somehow managed to get back on track. And here we are writing a new constitution, and it's great. Well, with all of this crowdsourcing, uh, undoubtedly people are calling for many things. Critics might say utopian things, like more and more social benefits uh, for uh, Icelandic citizens. It's going to cost more money. After that banking system crash of 2008 and, and the general financial depression of 2008 and beyond, how are you going to pay for this? Well, if anybody can really have a human rights uh, democratic society, uh, despite economic downfall, that would be Iceland. You know, we have a very, very, very uh, rich country regarding natural resources, and there's only 320,000 of us. The population is highly educated. Uh, we don't suffer from, uh, you know, many problems that other countries have. And despite the fact that we had this m amazing crash here, we are still in a good position to uphold the greatest human rights standards uh, available, you know. And that's a decision as well. I mean, it's, it, everything is a matter of priority, you know. And if your priority is to have a really good social welfare system, of course you can do that, you know. It might cost uh, a decision making such as never having an army, but I think that's a great decision to make. So um, I think that we are not in a state where we have to choose between having a welfare society uh, and something else. We are luckily still in a very good position. And we want to become like a, the sort of a nation we had promised ourselves to be. We got a little bit greedy and we got a little bit lost and we, we went off track. Okay. And now Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so, Christine, you know, why I'm actually a huge fan of this. I, I'm a huge fan of direct democracy and I really love that you're doing this experiment. But there's critics like Josh Keating at foreignpolicy.com who's saying, well, maybe this was a model that may have worked in the Viking days, saying that the country is too big now, the administrative tasks are too difficult for crowdsourcing. How do you defend direct democracy and defend yourself from critics like that and say that this actually can work even in modern society to have such a direct sort of democratic system as, as crowdsourcing your constitution? 
Okay, well, I think his, his critic is fair. I mean, I, I don't think that in the most strict sense we are doing it by crowdsourcing because we're not putting the text online and writing it all together. What we're doing is the 25 people is write, are writing the text together, putting all the suggestions online as we go, and there people can comment, those who want. You know. So what is happening is that there's a selective uh, audience, if you like. Those who are interested are participating. Those who are okay. not interested are not. Katrine. I want to throw you to Ahmed because Ahmed's got some really good feedback from Twitter and our many viewers. Ahmed, give us a taste of some of that feedback. Yeah, a lot of people find this idea intriguing, to say the least, whether they agree with it or not. Uh, Hos Fahmi is saying, crowdsourcing Iceland's constitution is the kind of idea that will make it the first created state in the information age. Now, son of philosophy uh, says ideas from the public should always be welcome, but much thought and effort ought to be required to make them politically viable. Now, crowdsourcing we've seen in these nascent uh, you know, governments in Egypt and in the Arab world have played a central role in eliminating bureaucracy and bringing about real change and security and stability. So there's one argument. But what, what do you think of this? I mean, do you take this point that you need to be careful to make it politically viable? No. I think that what has been proven in Iceland is the fact that people are in incredibly good at uh, participating and everything becomes much better with their participation. I, I, I was expecting this to be much harder, but the decision that we, or the sort of realization we've come uh, to is that the, you can totally trust people for things like that. And this is not too complicated for, crowd, for the public to be involved in it. Not, I mean, we're getting so good ideas from the public yeah. and we're using them, you know, mm. and it's great. We're only 25, we have limited time, but with their help, we can make it. You know? Katrina, I have a final question for you. I know you're going to stay with us for the post-show so we can continue this discussion online, but a final question for you on the TV show. This is all still going to be taking place in an advisory role towards the parliament. I mean, parliament has to make the final decision at the end of the day. They could, theoretically, ignore all your recommendations, can't they? They could, yes, but they would be in serious trouble if the if the nation, you know, the power of ideas is such that if you have a really good idea, it will conquer, you know, <laughs> and if our ideas are good enough, they will conquer. I'm sorry, that's just a fact. And I don't care about the formal path they will have to pass. They will still, they will still end up being used if they're good enough. Katrine, fantastic hearing your thoughts. Ahmed, give us one or two more tweets before we yeah, go. Yeah, the last one from Iron Chariots, to sum up, he's a supporter of crowdsourcing, is saying, it becomes more viable with larger crowds. So each new node in a network adds more connections than the one before. And it's certainly successful in the virtual realm, so we'll see yeah. if in government yeah, it's Yeah, maybe it can grow well. exponentially. Maybe this can be a model for the rest of the world, or maybe we're all just uh, dreaming of some sort of liberal utopia. utopia. We'll never know. Uh, we Katrine, so. thanks a lot uh, for that. Zed, Ahmed. Great pleasure having all of you and thank you for joining us in the stream. You can stay with us online, stream.aljazeera.com, to continue the conversation. If you're watching on TV, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for staying with us on the post show. Stream.aljazeera.com is where you're at, and we're just uh, getting into the thick of things with this conversation mm -hmm. about direct democracy or not in Iceland and crowdsourcing uh, being used as a tool to rewrite the constitution. Let's go back now to uh, Katrin. Uh, Katrin, why don't you address this, this idea uh, as to whether this is something purely uh, achievable within the Icelandic context or? it could possibly, hopefully, be used as some sort of model for other parts of the world. What do you think? Well, of course, that's what we hope. I mean, in the beginning, we were not thinking about that at all. But uh, since that, you know, the foreign media has caught the interest in this, uh, we have been thinking, why not? I mean, uh, it works am amazingly well. That's, that's a, a thing I can assure you of. But uh, again, we are 320,000, so maybe it's easier to manage. But I think that the wisdom of the crowd is so important when it comes to uh, creating a, a fundamental strategy that you shouldn't, you shouldn't actually sacrifice it, even if it takes a little bit more time and if it's a little bit more complicated. You're going to get much better end results. So mm. I think in the end of the day, uh, it, it will always be worth it, you know. And what's amazing, and I want to say, is that you don't get the the bullshit, sorry, that you normally <laughs> get online uh, through this canal. At least not in our experience. 
You know, we were a little bit afraid when we started putting everything out in the open that uh, people would just start, you know, slagging us and be all angry and uh, maybe rude and stuff. That hasn't happened at, at all. Yep. I think it's because the subject is very, uh, maybe, uh, you know, it, it, it needs a certain amount of care. This mm -hmm. is our constitution, our social contract. So we can't be, you know, behaving like idiots. Yep. We have to take it a little bit seriously. Yep. But uh, the ideas we're getting are great. You, you know, one thing, you know, I just want to share this with you. It's a kind of anecdotal story, so feel free to cut me off if I ramble too much. But one <laughs> okay, of our, stop. Okay, stop. <laughs> okay, done. No, one of the no, founders continue. of Storify, so this tool that we use to aggregate photos and videos and tweets, I was talking to him a couple months ago, and I know he's probably doing backflips now, so excited at the news that Iceland's doing this. Why? Because this actual tweet that we read, Iron Chariots, talking about nodes and networks and connections, I mean, he made an argument that this is the way to the future for the, for the sole purpose that oftentimes in government you have people who are not experts in certain areas mm. who as a result of the system of government and the electoral system, especially in this country, um, are, are making decisions that you know, perhaps they're not really qualified to make. Yeah. You know, they don't have an expertise. Right. So through crowdsourcing, it takes the system of nodes, you know, where mm. in the internet you have people who are influencers. We have this thing called clout, mm. which you know, highlights who on Twitter is influential on certain issues. So, to mirror that in government, I mean, theoretically, makes sense. Now, whether the, the application is successful or not, it'll be interesting to watch. But I just wanted to share that. Yeah, let's get Katrine's final thoughts because we've got another guest lined up from uh, Senegal that I really want to go to. Katrine, final yeah. thoughts from you. Okay, well, it's interesting what your colleague was saying because definitely that's what we're, we have faced in Iceland. I mean, we have had a, when the crash happened, our finance minister was a vet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that explains right. to you why happens when you have a very small society, you know, and uh, <laughs> people have to, like push each other because they like each other politically, you know, but what we have uh, got now is like, uh, for example, we're trying to put in the freedom of the information because we know that's the next big thing, you know, into our constitution. So what we do is we outsource it to the computer nerds. We say, guys, how can we do it the best way? And they open Etherpad and they like, and they get out the best, you know, parts of the discussion. You know, we might not use it all, but at least they give us the lingo and they give us the possibilities of thought. So, I mean, we are outsourcing to special groups as well, knowing that they just know more about it than us, you know, and, and that's yeah. exactly what your friend was talking about. You know, it's, it's a great ability to be able to give it to the people that have the best knowledge. Katrine, we're all watching this uh, new experiment very, very closely, and we hope you keep in touch as this unfolds. Katrine, thanks for joining us from Reykjavik. Very much. Good luck. Now, now, Ahmed, just before we get to Senegal, right. I just want you to give us another example of how, uh, how, how, how uh, positive crowdsourcing can be, not only looking towards the future, right. but how useful a tool it can be looking towards the past and uh, answering some of the mysteries of the past. Right. Uh, you're going to have to give me a second just okay, to pull this up, but I have it actually right here. Um, so this is a World War II yeah. mystery that has now been solved. On the blog of the New York Times, um, we see that basically they bought, there was this anonymous photo album from a Nazi photographer way back when, and uh, they've been, the New York Times bought this and they put it up online because there were questions as to who the photographer was, who the people in the photo were, actually a series of photos, frankly. And uh, the way that they w were able to solve this question, you know, this mystery of this like photo that just turned up from... Uh, I don't really uh, know. I think it's actually, sorry, forgive me, 214 mm -hmm. photos. I um, was just uploading it on their website and within, I believe it was four hours, mm -hmm. um, they were able to not only identify the photographer, but the people uh, in the photo as well. So a powerful tool. Yeah, Zed, we're learning new lessons with the wisdom of the crowd, not only for the future, but for the past as well. No, exactly. I mean, that, and working as a blogger, I can tell you that's exactly what we do. Um, yeah. You know, when we have a story, 12 other blogs will chime in, we'll have enough information, and we'll get a new story out of that, and it's wonderful. Yeah. That's how democracy works. So sorry, forgive me, just so that we can clarify. Uh, the photographer in question was Franz Krieger, um, mm. who was an Austrian who lived until 1993 and then eventually went on to be part of the Nazi party. But, uh, but then uh, we just wanted to emphasize the woman in question was Frieda Krieger, his right. wife. So right. they are both, uh, they're both, uh, you know, they've both passed away since mm -hmm. then, but still an interesting story nonetheless. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, dip into that and try and read some more on that. Uh, utterly fascinating. Now there's been... Um, some tumultuous times in Senegal, there was a proposed uh, constitutional change by President uh, Abdullah Wad. Mm -hmm. People rejected that and came out strongly against that. Let's speak to somebody in Senegal. Keve Banso, I understand, from Dhaka, joins us uh, from Skype. And uh, the president decided to rescind those changes because of the popular, popular uproar, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, he just end of the law because of the protest. Because since, since this morning there were uh, protests all over the, all over in Senegal, especially in front of the Asa National Assembly. So there were many 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 tension. Many people are arrested and and injured. Is there a feeling that uh, Abdullah Wad underestimated the strength of the opposition and the strength of feeling that people had in opposing these changes? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He just sent it off because of this, because of the many uh, protest and and also many uh, even even uh, the minister, even, even the uh, how he call him, uh, the, the 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 member of the government. Uh, they, they, they say they, they don't vote this, right. this law. Yeah. Ahmed, was there any internet traffic regarding this? Any videos that uh, have come through? Yeah, I'm actually playing a video. Uh, there have been several videos that we've been sharing. And, and frankly, early, early this morning, some photos that were sent to us from, uh, I believe, you know, netizens on the ground there, um, pretty much documenting some violent stuff. It's worth saying that we're going to be looking into this story and just more generally into this story mm. next week. Mm. Um, as it applies to not only Senegal, but other countries in Africa. Uh, to what extent, Keva, do you think that online sharing of, of videos and photographs from, from rallies, from protests, and uh, what look like riots as well, to what extent does it influence the decision-making in Senegal? Yeah, yeah, the influence, oh, yeah, yeah, this, the, the influence also, but... It's a lot of because of the the, the many youth what uh, were, were arrested also mm -hmm. and and there were many tension many tension they they uh, do you hear me hello yes yes we can hear you Keva okay yeah and and I, I think yeah it's influence also because there I hear that in radio that. Uh, the, the the government the, the American government called the president also to 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 tell him to tell him to Russia to, to end of this law. Okay, Keva Banso, thank you very much for joining us via Skype from Dhaka. It's been good getting your insight and getting a sense of what's happening on the ground. Yeah, thank you, thank you for Adjajer too, because it's it's important for for for, for us. Okay, great. The, 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 Great, Kevin. We are losing uh, the connection there, but Kevin Banso talking uh, to us there. Um, Zed, uh, one of the things that Ahmed mentioned that we are going to be covering next week, people seem uh, to easily connect the threads when you have revolutions in quote-unquote Arab countries or majority Muslim countries. So, for example, with Tunisia, with Egypt, with Yemen, etc., people would call it the, the uh, Arab Spring. Um, is there not an argument when you look at it? A lot of these countries are on the African continent. And of course, Ivory Coast uh, decided um, that Bagbo wasn't going to stick around despite the fact that he lost the election and said stubbornly that he was going to stay. You had South Sudan voting uh, in that referendum for secession. You've got turmoil in places like, like Senegal and elsewhere. Is there not an argument, perhaps, to say that there's an African spring taking place? No, and, and a lot of my work deals with internet social activism and tracking that, and I think there's definitely an African spring going on. But I take it even further. I would say mm. there's a people spring going right. on. I, uh, you know, beyond continents, beyond boundaries. Spain, no, Greece. Mm. Exactly. Thailand, Wisconsin. You know, the, the, mm. Famously, the leader of the Egyptian, of many Egyptian unions put out a statement in support of the people of Wisconsin saying that they were fighting uh, for their rights as well. So I think this is happening all over the globe. And, the internet is, of course, the best conduit for all of us to learn about it. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Speaking about learning about it, I just put in a quick search in Twitter, you know, because the amazing thing about Twitter is you can get whatever you want, whatever news you want mm -hmm. to learn more about. So I put in African Spring and I got this tweet from Estes Gould. So this wasn't sent to us, but it says, Uganda could be close to an African Spring, using that term, but, quote, the potential for havoc in Uganda is arguably greater even than Egypt. So this is, I believe, just judging by this, uh, an article in the Washington Post, and that's a direct quote. So yeah, it would be interesting to, to hear our contributor, uh, Roosevelt's uh, yeah, take opinions. On it's a yeah. shame. Maybe we'll Skype her in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's uh, leave it at that for the moment, gentlemen. That's it from me. Derek will be back in the seat from uh, Monday. Uh, you've, uh, you've enjoyed enough of me, I think. <laughs> Ahmed, it's been a pleasure yes. working with you. We've sharing, enjoyed uh, it. Picking your brain and just uh, sharing this, this platform with you. Zed, thank you very much. It's been 
two fascinating and insightful S-I-G-H, not C-I-T, <laughs> uh, days with you. Thanks a lot, uh, gentlemen, and thank you to, to all of uh, the members of the stream for making me feel so welcome. And thanks to you, the viewers, on stream.aljazeera.com. Keep watching. Bye-bye.